Nathan. Oh, you know, I feel like I've just stepped into a pool of warm water. You know, I mean, you guys just feel really, really good. I love the way you clap. <laughs> you clap so good. And uh, Special K was wonderful. Uh, I love getting, getting the body going, and she's so beautiful. Um, so it, it, was, it was really wonderful to, to uh, come. So, okay, so I sort of got to talk together, and it's very true that I was like a couple weeks early and pretty uh, crazy because I thought, oh, I got to give this talk tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to have to drink water because I have a condition that makes my mouth really dry. So you'll see me drinking water as I talk. I hope that's okay with you. Okay, so let's talk about reverie. When Nathan asked me to do a lecture on reverie, I really wasn't quite sure what reverie is. When I looked at, do you know what reverie is? I mean, how, how often would you say you talk about reverie? <laughs> I mean, probably not. How many have used the word reverie in their life? <laughs> how many have used it five times in their life? How many ever heard their mother use reverie? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. OK. So I was thinking, why reverie? I mean. Can you give me something else, please? But wherever you said, when I looked it up, it says it's a kind of pleasant daydreaming. It says pleasant daydreaming, but it seems to me to also imply a kind of heightened awareness. Would you say so? Okay. So I imagine myself looking out of a window thinking about birds and flowers. That sounds right. Okay. Uh, is it reverie or is it m a more common feeling when I wake up in the morning and my mind is just drifting from thing to thing? I'm retired, so I don't have to get up and rush to work. Shall I do the laundry today or go to Five Points Bakery for a Danish? Have you ever been there? Oh, uh, it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, is that kind of thinking reverie? You're daydreaming? Okay. The dictionary says the word was used more in the middle of the 1800s, but it's coming back in favor now. Maybe because of us. We're doing it. I never heard anyone in my family use the word, and I can't imagine the 25% of my family who came from Africa and were probably slaves in the mid-1800s standing around daydreaming though maybe experiencing horrors does make one experience even more reveries. Could that be possible? Psychologists used to show people who had a hard time identifying their feelings pictures of people's faces as they expressed emotions. Do you remember that? Anger, sadness, or frustration it seems people can identify a feeling more from a picture than they can from words. I, let me say something. I love your faces. You're really paying attention. It's, it, you're honoring uh, me. I really, I'm ready to cry. OK. Uh, perhaps that's why a poet has to put images in their poems, right? So I need a picture. Emily Dickinson wrote her poem about reverie around 1860. She was in her mid-40s. Here's a poem. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and a bee. A clover and one bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Are you in reverie right now? 
It's you know, you see, a poem can do that. Did you hear how the room got so quiet? I mean, it's like, it's like magic. Okay. As if her poem is saying that reverie can create something like an actual place, that reverie can change reality, that you could grow a prairie with just a few lines of poetry. When I was two or three, I believed that writing was magic. Maybe the unhappiness I sensed around me when I was two or three, my mother had given birth to a stillborn, my stillborn brother. Maybe it was so great and it could only be fixed by magic. I learned how to draw money, houses, and cars. I cut them out like paper dolls and gave them to my mother. And I really did not understand why she seemed to experience such short-lived gratitude. Why hadn't my gifts changed her life? Probably the closest I've come to writing about reverie is a poem of mine that is now showcased on Manhattan subways. The poem is called A Nap. I love you guys. Alone in my house, during a rainstorm, I open the back door so that the sound comes in and rain makes a little puddle inside the screen. It is early afternoon, though dark. I lie on my bed and put my papers down beside me. I am light as if there were no blame or guilt. Light inside, heavy out. Each part of me balanced, supported. My New York friends who ride the subways send me pictures of the poem with people sitting under it, their heads lolling back and forth as the subway moves, taking a nap. Nathan, we can show that picture. Tayyama Jess sent me this uh, picture. He said he couldn't resist taking a picture of these guys taking a nap. And, you know, can poetry change reality? Um, Nath, uh, perhaps a poem provides us with a shape that we can try on, step into it like a pantsuit. How does it feel? Is it the right size, or do we have to shorten the sleeves and take it in at the waist? Or should we just leave it in the fitting room? Is this how art works magic? Can art change what people think? Is the pen mightier than, for example, depression or nuclear war? Around the same time that Emily showed us how to make a prairie, what did Mary Shelley show us how to make? Frankenstein. Now we're asking questions about artificial intelligence. As they say, there's always something. Ross Gay wrote the Book of Delights in 2020. After his father died, he had determinedly looked every day for a year for something that delighted him and made a pact with himself that every day he would write a poem about it. Here's a poem. I'm gonna take some water. Are you okay? Okay. To the fig tree on Ninth and Christian. Tumbling through the city in my mind without once looking up, the racket in the lug work, probably rehearsing some stupid thing I said or did, some crime or other. The city, they say, is a lonely place until, yes, the sound of sweeping and a woman, yes, with a broom beneath 
which are now to the canopy of a fig, its arms pulling the September sun to it, and she has a hose to, I better do this. And she has a hose too, and so works hard, rinsing and scrubbing the walk, lest some poor sod slip on the silk of a fig and break his hip, and not probably reach over to gobble up the perpetrator. The light catches the veins in her hands. When I ask about the tree, they flutter in the air, and she says, take as many as you can help me. So I load my pockets and mouth, and she points to the stepladder against the wall to mean more, but I was without a sack, so my meager plunder would have to suffice, and an old woman whom gravity was pulling into the earth loosed one from a low-slung branch, and its eye wept like hers, which she dabbed with a kerchief as she cleaved the fig with what remained of her teeth, and soon there were eight or nine people gathered beneath the tree, looking into it like a constellation, pointing, do you see it? And I am tall and so good for these things. And a bald man even told me so when I grabbed three or four for him reaching into the giddy throngs of yellow jackets, sugar stoned, which he only pointed to smiling and rubbing his stomach. I mean, he was really rubbing his stomach like there was a baby in there. It was hot, his head shone while he offered recipes to the group using words which I couldn't understand. And besides, I was a little tipsy on the dance of the velvety heart rolling in my mouth, putting me down and down into the oldest countries of my body where I ate my first fig from the hand of a man who escaped his country by swimming through the night and maybe never said more than five words to me at once, but gave me figs. And a man on his way to work hops twice to reach at his last his fig, which he smiles at and calls, baby, come here, baby, he says, and blows a kiss to the tree, which everyone knows cannot grow this far north, being Mediterranean and favoring the rocky sun-baked soils of Jordan and Sicily, but no one told the fig tree or the immigrants there is a way, for the fig tree grows, it grooves, it wants, it seems to hold us. Yes, I am anthropomorphizing. God damn it, I have twice in the last 30 seconds rubbed my sweaty forearm into someone else's sweaty shoulder gleeful eating out of each other's hands on Christian Street in Philadelphia, a city like most which has murdered its own people. This is true. We are feeling each other from a tree at the corner of Christian and Ninth. Strangers, maybe never again. So, before he wrote about the fig tree, did it exist? Did something in him change as he wrote the poem? Did something inside you change as I read it? What do you think? Huh? It, it really does. Anybody else feel a little like something in them? You know, I taught in the poets in the school program for many, many years when they first started in the 70s. And I'd go into the fourth grade and the fifth grade and the third grade, and I'd get those kids to, to write poems. And it got as quiet as you got when I was reading that poem. Do you hear it? It's, it's a certain kind of attention 
inside your body and something is changing. Though the words inside of me still has an amorphous jelly-like shape with regard to reverie, giving this talk has helped me make it more real. And maybe it's better if the shape remains sort of mushy or at least thin like gossamer or stretchy spandex. About three years ago, the poet Sonia Sanchez, the great poet San San Sonia Sanchez, told me that every morning the first thing she does when she gets up is write a haiku and set her intention for the day. She, she suggested I try it. At that time, I had just found out I had a kind of cancer that would need treatment. I had retired recently. A relationship had just broken up. It seemed like the bottom dropped out of my life, as if I had lost my future. Have you ever felt that? I figured I'd try this exercise. I hope that writing a haiku every morning and setting my intention for the day would at least keep me writing, even if just a little. At the end of the day, I could feel like I had done something. So I've written a haiku every morning for about three years. And they aren't necessarily good. <laughs> I just aim for trying each day. I mostly stick to the formula. Do you know what the formula for a haiku is? You go. <laughs> a lot of people do that. Five, seven, five. OK, so the, it's pretty easy. The first line is five syllables, the second seven, and the third five. Now, I, I don't always do that, you know, but anyway. So here, here are some of my haikus. I tried to choose ones that, you know, were more interesting. OK. Am I gay? Bye? How much does a question mark weigh at the end of my life. Okay, that's what. Did you know baby mice cry when separated from their moms, like us? Yeah. <laughs> we shit in cleaner water than many people drink. Americans. I like that one. What if death is like a hot flash that comes over you and bang, lights out? <laughs> I hope mine is like that. And here's my favorite haiku ever. It's by Moritake. And I used to give this to the third and fourth graders all the time, and then they'd write you know, their own haiku. OK, here it is. The leaf I saw Drift back to the branch was a butterfly. Is that cool? The leaf I saw drift back to the branch was a butterfly. So something has to change when you do that, right? It's just amazing. OK. The translation doesn't follow the usual English form, which is five syllable seven and then five. But the thing I like best about haiku is how something changes from the beginning of the poem to the end of it. How your mind starts with a leaf, which at the end changes to a butterfly. A haiku seems to get you to participate in it. It makes you move your mind. I'd like to try an experiment together. OK, don't get nervous. <laughs> I've never done this before with any group, <laughs> but I really like you, so I'm going to try it with you. All right. Nathan is going to show us a painting by Surratt and play some music. Actually, it's called Reverie by Debussy. And I'm going to ask you to write a haiku. OK, now, so he, he put these cards that you could write on. And I have pins. Oh, thank you. He's going to pass around pins. OK, now, don't get nervous. Now, OK, 
This is an experiment, and you cannot do anything wrong. Nothing, nothing you write is wrong. You got to get that. Keep telling yourself that. When you, as you get nervous, you know, just make that mind go. I, I can't do wrong. Toy said, "I can't do wrong." Okay. So now, uh, first of all, write a few things down that you see in the picture. Just. Then you know, like a red star, blah blah. Just write a few things down that you see in the picture. Where's the music? Yeah, right down there. But you can't do wrong. You could do it on something else. That ain't Deb, you say? Oh, there we go. So just take a couple minutes. Don't, don't.
spirit. Don't be scared. Okay. <laughs> sure. Read it loud now. And be really kind of slow to it. Yeah, sure. No problem. Uh, so my face off the pictures, uh, kind of in my creativity within constraints. Okay. So skywalking in the park, playing, chatting, watching kids. A perfect day, but where's the food? <laughs> Dress anything like those present, or could I be you? Oh, oh. Yeah. You didn't do nothing, I told you. You see how you can do that? Isn't that wonderful? And, and like I say, when you're doing that, when you're in that state, you. You can't do wrong. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Red light social dogs. Misinformation. In four. Get to know me yet. Oh, can you do it again? Sure. Red light social dog. Misinformation inform. Get to know me yet. Take care. You know, that's the good thing about counting those souls. You know, you take out the <laughs> and it just get down to those really tight. Yeah. It's fun to hear these, isn't it? <laughs> what is expected, not our authentic selves. We remain on the whole. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Change it. Change it. The last line. Oh. 
But with the work with promises. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Way back here. Um, I responded also to the painting like you did. And I was looking at the lines of their body. So I was getting a feel for that. The first one, my back is so straight. But the world twisting around celebrates the sky. Celebrates what? The sky. And then the next one, the slouch melts into earth that is open enough to know openness freeze. And then uh, the last one was, I'm not looking up, down, around, or out either, but into the quiet. Say it again. I'm, oh. I'm not looking up, down, around, or out either, but into the quiet. You guys are wonderful. Yeah. If anybody wants to show me their haiku before you leave, please do. And we can talk about it on your effect. And you know, I want to tell you what Sonia told me to do and what I've been doing for three years. And it really helped, helped me. So what she does when she gets up in the morning is she writes a haiku and sets her intention for the day. Now, I don't mean, oh, I'm going to scrub the floor. Not that kind of intention, you know. Like, my intention was, you know, to be more gentle with myself that day. Or to breathe, you know, open my lungs and breathe more. So, any of you think you might try that for a week or two? You know, just for the help. So, okay, thank you, guys.